On behalf of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration for Community Liberty and the Indian Health Service, we would like to welcome everyone to the Long-Term Services and Supports webinar series. My name is Sherry Gay and I work for Kaufman and Associates. I will be your moderator today. Today's webinar is titled Win-Win Renegotiating Montana Tribally Owned Nursing Facility Rates. Before we begin, I would like to highlight the main features of your Zoom web webinar interface. First, the presentation slides will appear in the main window, while the speaker will appear in the top corner. At the bottom of your screen in the menu bar, here you will find the chat, raise hand, Q&A, and closed caption functions. Please use the chat box to report any technical issues you are experiencing. We will respond to these concerns as they come in. Next to the chat box is the raise hand feature. You're, you are able to use this during the Q&A segment to let us know when you'd like to unmute your mic so you can ask a question. Another way you're able to submit a question is the Q&A box itself, where you can leave your questions at any point during the webinar for the presenters to address during the Q&A segment at the end. Lastly, live captioning is available for today's broadcast. Simply click the CC icon to use this feature. Please be aware that today's webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be made available online in the near future on cms.gov. With that said, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Please note this webinar series is supported by a contract awarded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar of those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And now we're going to start the webinar in a good way. And I'm going to turn that over to Jean Sorrell. Yes, Dinya Kuke. Lem Lem Tresia. Gulen Tilton. Grandfather Creator, we just ask that you bless us this day. We open in a good way to clear our hearts, to clear our minds, and open for the messages that we're about to hear. Each day we learn and we take and walk the path that you have given us. Today, Grandfather Creator, we're on this special path, and we ask that you give us this opportunity to share with each other and to learn, to help and protect our people as we walk through this day. I always say walk because we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us, who brought us the knowledge and the spirits that help us each day. In a good way, we ask that the Creator blesses each and every one of you, blesses your family, and gives you thanks for being here to allow us to share our thoughts, our blessings, and to ask the grandfather creator to help us, to take and show us the way, to lead us and to not turn back. We've started a new path and we continue on that path. For this we pray to you. Lem Lem Stupia Pesia Shehoi. Thank you, Jean. And my name is Anna Whiting Cyril, and I have been given the honor. Um, I am also a KAI employee and have been given the honor to introduce our presenter today. Um, we couldn't have anyone more qualified. 
um, Miss Mary Dalton is the former um, Medicaid state director for the state of Montana. She, um, during that time, she also um, was a, uh, the branch manager of, of many, many, many um, Medicaid funded operated programs and facilities. Uh, what, what I love the most about Mary is she um, understood that in Montana, we, um, Mon Montana's Medicaid program was 25% American Indians, Alaska Natives. And so to understand and to have the absolute best um, Medicaid program, we needed to include uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives in every decision we made, not just those that were very specific. Um, and so with, with that, um, you know, Mary was able to get to know Indian country in Montana. She took it very seriously and has continued even through her retirement to stay engaged with tribes and to make sure that their voice through her is sitting at every table. So with that, Mary, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, express my gratitude and thanks for your willingness to come and share your knowledge with us today. Thank you, both Jean and Anna, for, for um, starting this meeting in a good way. And to the rest of you, I'm really glad to be here. And I think we might as well go to the, the objectives. So we hope at the end of this day, you'll know why renegotiating Medicaid can be a win for the facility residents, for the tribes and the state Medicaid agency. And there's not a lot of things where there is a win-win. So this is, uh, was one way for us to really move some things forward. I wanna describe the process of building support and trust that, that we used, and maybe there'll be a couple tips that you can implement and review what Montana included in the Medicaid state plan. Next slide, please. What we did in Montana was that the tribal nations in the state of Montana came together and developed one new Montana Medicaid reimbursement rate for tribally owned nursing facilities. Um, I'll explain as in a few slides later why we chose one rate instead of facility specific rates. Um, the caveat on this is that in order for the state to receive 100% FMAP, the tribe must have a 638 agreement with IHS to provide nursing facility care. The tribe is the one that has to bill Medicaid. Even if they have a contracted entity operating the nursing facility, the money has to come back to the tribe and they have to take responsibility for the service. And the tribal nursing facilities continue to be um, licensed and certified by the state of Montana and they must comply with all the nursing facility rules and regulations. Um, so they're subject to the same quality measures as all other nursing homes in Montana. Next slide. We worked with two tribal nations, Crow and Blackfeet, who both own nursing facilities. And both of these, um, Crow is down in the southeast corner, Blackfeet is, is in the northwest corner, were in areas that were pretty remote and both facilities had low census. And that was important when you'll see the rate that we developed. Um, Crow had 13 people in their nursing home. Blackfeet had around 25, um, so pretty small nursing homes. Both those nursing facilities were being subsidized by their respective tribes at approximately a million dollars annually. So there was great incentive um, for them to not have to do that anymore and to be able to spend those health dollars someplace else. And both wanted to um, provide better services to their tribal members. And, um, even with that subsidy from their tribe of a million dollars and their Medicaid re reimbursement, I remember being down with Crow and talking about their needs and they were explaining that um, Crow is in a windswept area. They were traveling people over a hundred miles um, round trip for medical care to Billings in a 10 year old van. I just kept thinking, wait, that, that's not safe for people working age or younger people, it's certainly not safe for their elders. So um, they had some things that they weren't able to keep up with. Next slide. From a state Medicaid agency perspective, 
the Affordable Care Act of 2010 um, and the reauthorization of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act brought new opportunities to provide and or refinance long-term care services. So things really were not available until this. And from a state standpoint, this was a real low risk opportunity for us to provide meaningful assistance to tribal governments and members. Um, nursing facility residents are an ongoing cost. So un, unlike um, some other things where you might have an operation and then you're well and go off, um, if you're in the nursing home on Medicaid, you're gonna be probably a Medicaid paid member. Um, so it's expensive overall for the state. And in these two particular facilities, all the rest residents were both IHS and Medicaid eligible. So refinancing from a state Medicaid agency perspective allowed us to save the state general fund approximately 500,000 annually back in 2014. So inflated forward to whatever that would be. And we also shared the concerns over the service limitations to tribal members and the financial stability of the facilities. Um, the smallest facility in particular was on pretty shaky ground. Next slide. One of the ways that we were able to do this negotiation was that we were able to earn trust. And um, if there are CMS or Medicaid staff on there, I would say that, that one of the things about earning trust really is that you have to model the behavior you wanna to see to your staff. Um, so as Anna said in the, in the introduction, one of the, the things that we implemented was that we thought about what the impact of Medicaid decisions would be on tribes, whether it was something that was tribally specific or not. And that was a question that my staff learned to anticipate because if they came into my office and said um, they wanted to do X, Y, Z, the first question I asked them was, what is the impact gonna be to tribes? And if they couldn't answer that, they had to go back and then reschedule and come back and tell me um, what that impact was gonna be. We were lucky enough or had enough foresight uh, to have started to build relationships with the tribes before we ever went into this negotiation. So that made it easier in Montana than it might be in some places, depending on what your relationship is with the, with the state Medicaid agency. Um, in Montana, not only do we have formal negotiations, uh, Medicaid negotiations where people come into Helena, but we did what we called tribal tours twice a year, which really enabled, I went on all of them, um, to the, the uh, seven nations at that time um, and visited each of those reservations, IHS hospitals, tribal health things, um, both in the, the spring and the fall. That allowed me to, to start to build a relationship. You could kind of tell when I first showed up and we would um, meet with the tribal council, they would kind of look at you and they were very polite and shook hands and everything, but it really wasn't until probably about the third time that that I'd come back that they would say, oh, I met you before. And I think really started taking it seriously that, that we were serious about building a relationship. Um, I think that it's important for all of us to remember that you need to get out of wherever your central office is and go to where the community is because it gives you a much better understanding of the strengths and challenges that people are facing when you're there. So with all of that, and with the change that happened in 2010, I don't honestly remember whether um, Crow brought it up first to me and I researched it or if I brought it up first to them, but we started looking at in 2014, whether or not we could do something about nursing homes. And we began uh, individual overtures uh, with both tribes at that time. I think one of the things that, that we also did to earn trust that was that I was crystal clear in all my discussions with, with uh, tribes and tribal councils that it was going to be beneficial for all parties. And in, that was important for me because I think you have to be scrupulously honest. If you don't admit that it was gonna be good for the state, which it was, we say 500,000 a year in 2014, um, people are always looking and wondering, what is it that they're hiding? What is it that, um, that what's in it for them? Um, 
it's better in my mind to be honest, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing about what it is that you expect to get here. Otherwise, you know, that old phrase of I'm from the government and I'm here to help, it doesn't go very far. There's, there's people, the people in Montana have a healthy, healthy skepticism about that. I think it was also important to be transparent. Um, one of the things that we were doing in this, because we negotiated one rate, is that that rate was going to apply to two different tribes facilities, and that rate was going to apply to any tribes that might want to offer nursing home services in the future. And um, while no tribe would say it publicly, I heard several times via the grapevine that tribes were nervous about what right rate was going to be negotiated and whether or not some tribe was um, going to be a subpar negotiator and come in too low. Um, they didn't need to worry. Uh, both the, the Crow and the Blackfeet Nation are very good negotiators and, and uh, that wasn't a concern. But you know, people didn't know that yet. I think the other thing where we had to earn trust honestly was even internally within my agency because we were changing a nursing home methodology that we used for everybody else. And there was a lot of concern about whether that was fair um, with my staff. They'd had to defend that rate in different kinds of negotiations. They knew that we were gonna offer this different rate and different way of of establishing rates to these two facilities, but the other 79 facilities were not gonna get the advantage of it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of almost that mom thing that, that comes in that you wanna treat everybody fair. In this case, you know, you have to explain to people why you're doing the methodology model again, that you're serious about it from the top if you're a state, uh, Medicaid person, um, but let people express their thoughts and then then tell them, um, you know, those were private meetings with the with the state staff and then tell them what it was that that I wanted to see and and why I thought it was going to be a, a good thing. Um, as we did these consultations, we really over consulted on this particular spa um, and we did that on purpose. Um, because it was one of the first major refinancing initiatives we were doing. So we did public notice, we met with all the tribes, we did individual with the Crow, we did an individual consultation with the Blackfeet, and we came back together and explained to um, other tribal governments what was the, the outcome of those negotiations with Crow and Blackfeet before we ever submitted the SPA. You wouldn't have to go through that many steps but I think it was important for us to be transparent. Next slide, please. Because IHS doesn't establish nursing facility or any other long-term services rates, um, we had to start someplace. And I originally wanted to just adopt the all-inclusive outpatient rate. And, and be done with it because that's set federally every year. We wouldn't have had to, to do a lot more work on it. Um, CMS rightfully said no, that they really couldn't take that outpatient rate and apply it to an inpatient facility. Um, it didn't make sense to us to look at the inpatient rate for hospitals because the hospital and the nursing facility um, services wouldn't be the same. So we ended up having to develop a rate methodology that we could use for, for long-term care. And we chose a, a methodology that's called a negotiated rate methodology um, because it allows the state and the tribal government to do just what it says. And then you have to, which is to negotiate a rate. And then you also have to negotiate that rate um, with CMS. My personal experience is that if you suggest to um, CMS that you want to do a negotiated rate, it's really hard for some of the federal and state financial staff um, to accept that methodology because it is that, it's a negotiation, it's a, it's a give and take. Um, finance people like things that add up and tick and tie and little 
little columns and um, a negotiated rate does not necessarily do this. But it is an acceptable rate methodology. And if you get pushed back, if you decide you wanna do a negotiated rate, you get pushed back from CMS, you just have to stand firm and keep explaining to multiple people probably about what kind of a rate methodology you have and why you, why you got there. So the rate that we established is reasonable, but it's not cost-based and it's not subject to retroactive settlement back to costs incurred. And that's important for us. We didn't want, the good thing about a cost-based reimbursement, um, if, you, if you go with that methodology is that all your costs are, are paid for. The bad thing is they're paid for on a retroactive basis and you never have money to move forward with some of the improvements. So we didn't want that. We didn't want a cost-based um, methodology, although that was suggested to us by CMS. We wanted it to be reasonable and we wanted it to be a perspective forward moving rate. Um, it was invaluable to me in this because I was doing the negotiations with the tribes um, myself to involve my senior and long-term care administrator who uh, not only was responsible for setting rates for nursing facilities in Montana, but um, the way that Montana is structured at that time, she also had responsibility for running two state veterans homes, uh, nursing facilities. So she was well aware of the being, could look at it from both sides. She was both a provider and a reimburser um, of services. And she really knew the ins and outs of cost reports and how to, how to structure what we were saying and going forward to CMS. Our negotiated rate does recognize Montana's tribal nursing facilities have a really small resident census to support costs and are dependent on Medicaid for payment. Next slide. One of the considerations in developing the negotiated rate is that you really have to know in your state um, the percentage of the residents in the nursing facility who are IHS eligible prior to beginning that negotiation. And that's no matter what side of the negotiation you're on. Um, CMS has a policy. It's not a rule. It's not in regulation, but it is a longstanding policy of theirs um, that they're, they're not willing to back off of at least so far, that for one facility, you have to have one Medicaid rate. So they're n they were not open to looking at paying for um, a certain rate for people that were IHS Medicaid eligible, and then a different rate for people that were only Medicaid eligible. And um, you need to know the mix in your facility because if some people are not IHS eligible, you're gonna get the regular state FMAP mix, whatever that might be, instead of 100%, um, which could result in an increase in your um, state general fund cost, depending on what that particular mix was. The, the uh, state's federal medical assistance or assistance percentage of FMAP also plays a big part in these calculations. Montana roughly runs about 35% um, state general fund, 65 federal, and it'll go up and down two or three percentage points from that. But roughly when you're doing a, a calculation in Montana, you can figure a 30 year costs are gonna be state general fund. Um, If you are a state that is closer to a 50 50 uh, general fund, it's, there's a better chance for savings if you can renegotiate your nursing home rate, depending on what, again, the, the resident mix is in your um, facility. Montana, we didn't have to do a lot of that math because virtually everybody in these two facilities was IHS eligible um, and on Medicaid eligible for 100% FMAP. But our neighboring state, which had done it earlier, um, Wyoming, their particular facility had more of a 60-40 match. What does that mean? It means that as you're saving um, state general fund, replacing it with federal funds to refinance, 
as you raise the rate, you have to um, to balance out how high that rate can be to still keep it cost neutral for your state if that's important to you. So, you know, one of the things to know both on both sides of the negotiation is what does the state want out of the rate negotiations? Is their goal non-monetary? Um, are they doing it to, to further the health of people in their state? Could be. Do they have to at least achieve cost neutrality at a very minimum? Often that's true. I worked for Medicaid for 30 plus years and um, cost neutrality was usually a, a very big part of uh, at a minimum, anything that I was allowed to negotiate. Or do they have a targeted general fund amount they have to save by implementing a new negotiated rate? Um, that will all go into the, the mix of how you look at your rates. Um, So it's really important to know politically and financially if the state's willing to absorb increased general fund costs for some residents, if everybody in the facility is not IHS Medicaid. Next slide. You also have to know what does the tribe want out of the negotiated rate. You know, in our case, the, the two tribes had been subsidizing their facilities, and that was a million dollars for each of them that they could have been spending on other health care services or other services to their tribal members. So they wanted at least that much out of it. Um, but they might also have an amount that they have to cover for um, things that are not so directly related to Medicaid. I think the biggest one of those is really tribal indirects that um, much as in state government, lots of, of tribes in Montana, at least, um, every department or every enterprise that they have has to pay some kind of an indirect. And those can vary widely amongst the states. Um, none of those were an issue in Montana because all of our facilities were IHS eligible. But had they not been, we would have had to, to enter into a, um, a different kind of a negotiation and figure out whether or not the tribe would be willing to put up a certified match to pay for the people that were not IHS Medicaid eligible. Um, I wish we had a whiteboard because we did. We could we could go through that funding, but but really, it's it's all a match uh, or a, a negotiation as you're looking through it with the tribe. Um, is the state going to require the tribe to put up a certain amount of dollars? And then, if the if if for instance you had ten percent of your um, clients were not IHS and you're raising the rates significantly and the, the tribe puts up the certified match for that 10% instead of, um, as a government entity, instead of the Medicaid agency, what would that mean to the rate? Where is it that, how much more money is that gonna be and where is it that the, that the tribe will have to go in order to be um, neutral or achieve the the savings or the increased revenue that they need at that point. Next slide, please. So um, we say that Montana negotiated the rate um, based on these final, final things, but while they were in negotiation and we did meet with each of the tribes separately and then come back, um, each of the tribes that owned a facility separately and then come back, they were really more of a collaborative work meeting than a negotiation meeting where somebody would throw out this rate, somebody else would throw out a different rate, then we would separate and caucus and, and talk about it. Um, although each of the meetings with the Crow and the Blackfeet had a, a little different flavor to it. Um, one of them sent a delegation to Helena by listening to what their thoughts are on what they wanted. You know, we knew going into it that they at least wanted to not be having to put a million dollars in to subsidize those facilities, but they
good. You, you just went blank for me on a minute. I was worried there. Um, was based on the cost of delivering services. We already had um, cost report data as a baseline to use. We adjusted that to the occupancy patterns at the tribal facility. So cost reports are usually a couple years old. One facility in particular had lost residents. So we didn't want to just use that, that data as it came in. We wanted to use what their costs were adjusted to what their, their current occupancy was. Um, we considered the amount of tribal subsidy that had been provided. And then we started looking at things over, uh, such as the geographic impact um, for a couple different areas for them. Um, they were really getting killed by turnover um, because both of these nursing facilities happened to be, while they were in a small town, they happened to be where the tribal um, services, health services were being offered and where IHS was operating. So they had a lot of competition for, um, for who they were trying to recruit for their RNs and CNAs and, and some of the other direct care staff. So we started out and looked at things like how many staff did they have? Were they missing any key staff? You know, did they have a PT or an OT or speech therapist? If they didn't have them um, on board as an employee, did they at least have a contract to have them? What were the raises that they were gonna need to have to be competitive? Um, so we looked at the local wages for IHS hospital for a nurse, for instance, and their local hospitals and the nursing facilities in the area. And then many of these facilities, um, I don't think either one of them were offering a retirement plan at the time. So we looked at retirement plans and sick leave and vacation and health insurance and um, the increased cost of contracting for travelers if they were unable to hire somebody. So it ended up that we took what was a wage um, for an RN and increasing that by about 25% as an example to get to where they wanted to. Um, for indirect staff, we did much of the same thing, but some of the things that we looked at that you might not necessarily think about were housekeeping staff, grounds and maintenance staff, their boiler operator. Um, they were having a hard time keeping that person because it's a particular set of skills um, and they were competitive. And then looked at the same thing about retirement, sick leave, all of those other things. We then also looked at what were their unmet needs and equipment and transportation and ground maintenance and housekeeping to, de to deliver those services. And those services we amortized at 30% a year. Um, so, you know, we looked at how old was their boiler? Did it need to be replaced? How old were their generators? Did they have backup generators? Um, as I already shared with you, Crow needed a new vehicle. They needed a new van. They shouldn't have been uh, transporting people in a van that was 10 years old. We looked at the condition of their roof. Did it need to be replaced and their flooring? And did they have fences? And did their windows need to be replaced? All of those kind of things. Um, and that's where I say it really became a collaborative meeting. So we started off with, with the known. We listened to what both Crow and Blackfeet came in with as to, to what they wanted, and then we led them through this series of questions and, um, and increased the rate to get to negotiate the rate of, of what we, we thought it should be. We, we did do these separately. We did that deliberately because um, it, it, um, it actually bore out what we thought was going to happen. We thought that the rate was going to be higher in the lower census facility because you're spreading the costs of a director of nursing and an administrator and a lot of other staff across a lot fewer people. Um, but by doing that, we were really able, again, to be transparent and, and to be able to say, so this is what the, the facility that's got the lowest census needs. Um, and that, that's what we wanted to apply in one rate to everybody because we didn't want to do a cost-based reimbursement and we didn't want to have to, to fiddle a lot with it in the future. Next slide. So Montana put all of these changes into our service 
9A Indian Health Services Spa. And we did that deliberately. CMS really kind of pushed back at first and wanted us to put this into the, the nursing facility spa. Um, but the, the problem with doing that from a Montana standpoint is the nursing facility spa is opened at least annually. And we knew that if we put it in the nursing facility, while the, while the uh, Indian Health Services Spa is open much less often, um, we knew if we put it into the nursing facility spa that we would have to answer questions every year about how we got to that negotiated rate. And while that's not insurmountable, um, it does take a lot of time to try and educate people who don't deal a lot with IHS um, tribal funding about the intricacies of being able to have a different rate, being able to have a negotiated rate when the other one is, is, uh, is more of a prospective rate. Um, just didn't want to go through that hassle. The other thing was that, that you know, um, as you're looking forward, I knew I was gonna retire eventually. I was getting near the end of my, my career with state government is when you put it into a spa from a state side where, where people um, are not used to what's being in there, sometimes things will get taken out of a spa in future years just because somebody didn't know it was important. So if you have a choice, as I said, it's not insurmountable if they put it in the IHS spa, but I definitely recommend that you put it in your um, Indian Health Services Spa. Next slide. One of the things that we did sort of last minute that turned out to be really genius was um, one of my, my state staff that, that was working with it says, let's just put in this spa that we're going to um, increase the rate annually based on the inpatient hospital percentage increase or decrease. So right before we put it in, we throw that in um, and we had negotiated for a, a rate of 389.14, which was an increase of about $230 per resident per day um, with the tribes put in this automatic inflator. Um, that has proven to be really, really valuable. That rate has only decreased once in eight years, so it goes up automatically um, in between 2020 and 2021. The rate went down about $7. Um, we had different people that were nervous about that. We just said, no, that's okay. Um, you know, that was the methodology we chose. Sometimes it'll go up, sometimes it'll go down. But the 2020 22 approved right now is $683.29 um, compared to the Montana average nursing home rate of $208.71 plus some other add-ons that, that they get for um, direct care wage and, and other things. So their rate is actually higher than that, but there's still a big difference. Um, the one thing, other that I would include in a spa if I were doing it today, and we asked for it in 2014 and didn't get it is, um, if I were doing this spa again, I would ask for, to be able to use whatever rate you negotiate for any contracted bid that a, that a tribe may want for one of their residents. So as I said, only two, two um, tribes in Montana run nursing homes. For the other tribes, their residents are in a community nursing home. It would be possible for the tribe to contract for those beds um, in a change that came about in 2016 when, when um, CMS opened up 100% FMAP availability. And if I was doing an, an amendment today, that's something that I would put in. Next slide. You know, the interplay between Medicaid and IHS is pretty complex. So as you get ready to go into these negotiations and or any other area that you might be looking at, I would encourage you to educate yourself about IHS and Medicaid um, and to be the best advocate you can be. 
because um, my experience is that there are very few people, even in CMS, even in the state Medicaid agencies, um, some tribal people honestly have a better understanding about this interaction that, than either of those places that understand when 100% FMAP is available, when a negotiated rate is available, um, they just don't work with it. And so they're, they're great experts in whatever their field is in Medicaid, but it may not be in understanding the nuances of, of IHS. So as you negotiate, I'd encourage you to be patient to a point, to educate. I don't think you have to, the more people who understand it, the better advocates I think you have the better for communication. But if you're really not getting it, or you're not getting a place with your negotiations, I think you should also not be afraid to ask for a specialist at either the state or the CMS level. The other thing that, that's helpful is if you have another state that has an approved state plan or waiver, if you know about that, to let the state Medicaid agency and CMS know. Um, I know that Montana, Wyoming, and Washington all have approved SPAs for enhanced tribally owned nursing facility reimbursement. They're all a little bit different, um, but those are good, a good starting place to look at. Next, next uh, slide. And I would say in conclusion that, that don't forget to continue to build relationships. So one of the things that we did was when we were successful at getting this um, increased rate, we celebrated. And I, I think we forget to do that with our partners. It helps really bond people together. So the, the first, uh, I'm going to tell you a little story about, about the first, we finally get the, the rate approved. Um, and we called down to Crow and said, um, can we come down? We need to talk to you about rates. And they were very gracious and agreed. We set up a time to do it. But um, when we got down there, it was their tribal health director and a couple of the staff. Well, we had, we had been successful in this negotiation with CMS, and so I had a big fake check printed. I'm talking big. It was probably three feet by five feet, signed by me, so it could never be cashed any place. It wasn't any good. Um, and I took that out and presented it to the health director and he goes, well, just a minute. And he goes out of the room. And I can hear him speaking crow in the background. And probably within 12, 15 minutes, we had a dozen people there because they really had thought that we had come down to say, I'm sorry, um, you know, we tried with CMS, but we weren't able to get this rate. Um, instead, we were able to celebrate, and that was very important to those people that are working at the, the tribal level, as well as the people at the state. I took my senior long-term care administrator down there so that she could see what the impact was going to be, and Crow had unfortunately um, just had um, funerals that week for some, some people that um, had been murdered, and so the, the community was kind of in mourning. And we sat with, with um, that group of 10 or 12 people for probably two hours and listened to their stories about what this change in reimbursement was going to mean to their people. Um, you know, it, it was, as one of them said, we needed a ray of hope, and you brought that to us this week. And I think we really cannot underemphasize how important it is to celebrate and to, to keep encouraging people about doing good work. Crow did good work, my state people did good work, CMS did good work. Um, so, you know, we had all kinds of pictures that were taken, they were posted on Facebook, they were in the newspaper, and I shared those pictures and those articles with CMS as well, because they were a big part in getting this um, rate approved, and it really does mean something to people on that local level. And everybody needs some encouragement at some time. So um, that celebrating and saying thank you, um, best things you can do to keep your relationship going. Um, I think you can't ever underestimate the, um, 
the fact that most people that are involved in any kind of health care, that includes all of the Medicaid programs, both at the state and the federal level, they want to do things that do work that benefits people. And we're too quick to give negative feedback to people and not quick enough to give positive feedback and to tell people that, um, you know, what they did really did make a difference. Sometimes it's hard to tell when you're in the, the cog, you know, that you're pressing the yes button really meant something to somebody else. So um, a short note, an email, a text, a voicemail, thanking people for their help and letting them know why the result is important is the best relationship investment you can make. I'll guarantee you that people at the state level and people at the federal level will remember that. And you get bonus points if you can CC that to their boss. Um, and I did take the time after this, this uh, state plan amendment and another one that, that we worked with uh, CMS on that was very beneficial for Montana tribes to drop a note as a state Medicaid director to the people that I worked with at the Gen Denver uh, regional office as well, just to tell them how important it was and uh, that we had emphasized to people that it was a partnership between tribal state and federal government because nothing in Medicaid happens um, on these kind of uh, state plan amendments without all three of those governments being um, invested in that we were successful because we worked together. And with that, that concludes my remarks and I'd be glad to answer any questions people might have. Thank you, Mary. This is our time for questions. We'll be addressing the questions already submitted in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. So if you haven't submitted yours yet, please do so now and use the raise a hand icon and we'll get to as many questions as we can. We do have one. Is there any information or methodology for negotiating assisted living rates? Um, no, Be because for um, assisted living rates, Medicaid doesn't pay room and board. So your methodology would have to go through the other services that you're paying for. So I'm going to use Montana as an example. Um, in Montana, if you're on the home and community-based long-term care waiver, you can get um, a rate for, for certain services provided in that assisted living facility, but the assisted living facility itself is not paid for. You'd have to do something about enhancing those other rates for services that are coming in for people. Um, and that's something that that we didn't achieve while I was there in Medicaid. Um, I've been trying to kind of beat the bushes here in Montana because I, I think um, it's an area that, that honestly, um, for community first choice and other services, we, we pay um, the same, the same Tribal providers get the same rate as all other providers, and I think that that's an area that could be renegotiated and, and uh, people could look at. Thank you, Mary. Um, so there's another question. I work with a company based in California that makes remote chronic disease testing products. Would these type medical products be useful for tribal LTC facilities? I don't know. You, they, they honestly would have to talk to those facilities themselves. Could be. There, there are a lot of um, telehealth services in Montana, and Montana has paid for different telehealth services for 20, 25 years. Okay, wonderful. Any other questions um, that we can have Mary answer? Um, there is one. I, in Montana, is the higher rate available to community nursing homes serving IHS eligible residents? No, but that is something that 
in 2016, um, CMS changed their policy and allows um, a tribe to contract for services now. If the, if the tribe contracted, I, I don't know if anybody is doing this yet, but, but it, it's given as an example in the stuff that, that CMS sent out, so I know that it's, it's doable. If the tribe placed me into a nursing facility and the tribe was willing to take responsibility for my care and um, do a contract with that nursing facility to take care of me, the tribe would have to bill and then for that person and they would have to negotiate the rate with the local um, nursing home facility. I don't know if I said that clear as mud or not, but the rate is gonna have to go through the tribe because they're the only ones that can get 100% FMAP and they're the only ones that would be able to get that enhanced rate. I, I think it's something that um, is doable and something that I'd be really interested in seeing. I think it would be beneficial to local nursing facilities as well as as to tribal members, because I think some of the things that tribes could do then would be to require, you know, if I'm the tribe and I'm negotiating for my member to be placed there, maybe I require that there be um, somebody that speaks my language. Maybe I require that there be certain um, activities that are, are directed towards things that, that um, were important to me in my life as a tribal member. Um, and I, I think that that would give the tribes some ability to, to do care that, that would be more culturally relevant to their tribal members as well. And be good for nursing homes because they're probably not gonna negotiate it at the Medicaid rate. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have another question. In Montana, what is your best recommendation to move forward with Montana Medicaid nursing home rates with many nursing facilities on the verge of closing? I, I think it's an issue that we'll have to, to go through the legislature, but um, it, I, I think one of the things that's happening with nursing homes is they're kind of getting caught in this pinch, right? Um, I don't want to insult anybody on facilities. There's lots of wonderful facilities, but I've never heard anybody say, I want to go to a nursing home ever. So, you know, the, the people that were there in a nursing home 20 years ago are not the same people um, as are, are there now. And part of the, the difficulty in Montana is, I think still, we're overbedded for one thing too. And you know that was one of the problems that one of these particular nursing homes were having there. They only had 13 residents to support all the things that go into a nursing home. But it really all comes back to the legislature and somebody has to be willing to pay higher, higher taxes in order for there to be a higher rate. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have time for a few more questions. If you wanna go ahead and type those in the chat or the question and answer box. Um, there was one comment, great work, Mary, your enthusiasm and care for others is inspiring. I did wanna make sure that that was voiced and thank you for that. We'll give everyone just a couple more seconds here and otherwise we can um, get ready to close the webinar if there's no other questions. All right, I would like to thank Mary for joining us today and helping us better understand the process of renegotiating tribally owned nursing facility rates. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and that the audio and presentation slides will be made available online at cms.gov. Thank you again for joining today's webinar. Our session is now concluded. 
Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.